Joshua chapter 10, please. In chapter 9, we talked about the, uh, the neighborhood enemy, how Gibeon, the Gibeonites, um, knew that their city was um, in, in the path of, of Israel and Israel conquering the land of Canaan. And what they did is they, they played a trick. They played a trick on Israel, made themselves uh, to be someone who they weren't, dressed up in old clothes, torn clothes, said, we are people from a far away country. And, and, the, and then, uh, I, as the text that we read in chapter 9, there, there was an inkling in Israel that they knew that something was up, but they still w- and did something that Moses had cautioned them not to do back in Deuteronomy, was don't make a covenant with people outside or in, in the land of Canaan. And what did Israel do? They made a covenant with them. All right? So... So what happened after they found out that they that they were their neighbors, that they weren't really from a far country, or the food wasn't really uh, well. The food was old and stale, but it wasn't old from and stale from the trip. And uh, so they made them their uh, their servants. Okay. So that was enlisting the neighborhood enemy, and so they would serve Israel. Uh, for um, uh, many, 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 many years, okay? So today we're going to talk about, we're going to start in Chapter 10, about defending the neighborhood enemy. And any time we make an agreement with someone or something like an organization, whether it's a Christian organization or a secular one, um, I think it was back in the, oh, Early 90s, maybe? Somebody can correct me on this. Remember um, when Promise Keepers got real big? Promise Keepers, it was based out of Colorado. And 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 and, and now, you got to remember something here. If uh, you don't know it, uh, uh, most of you know it, I'm, I'm, a, um, I'm a graduate of Moody. So Moody is known for their Bible teaching and their training of missionaries. So when the uh, when the big promise keepers thing was just exploding across this nation, uh, one of my professors, uh, you've met him, uh, 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 I had questions, and the other men had questions, and and uh, his and his counsel was hold off, just hold off to see what it's all about. Well, next thing you know, the promise keepers comes out with their points and making covenants and making covenants with different religious organizations that we sh- they shouldn't make covenants with. But see, that's the problem with uh, many times, whether it's secular or within the Christian community, we run and make we, uh, uh, we run and make agreements and and covenants and and we tend on you know jumping in without really. You know, having the wisdom to take a step back, and Dr. Vanderwerk taught me that. He said, "You know what? Just don't don't run. You know, don't even walk. Just stand still and see what happens." Well, it wasn't long before the doctrinal statement of promise keepers and other things kind of blew up, and and then it, what was this went. Psh, and so, and I hope you get my point. And and uh, and I mentioned it. Um, and everybody and everybody jumps on the bandwagon, you know. Religious leaders, oh, promise you, you know. Well, no, you know, you got to take you got to take your time. And people did that. And you've heard me talk about Willow Creek, you know, Willow Creek. Oh, everybody wants to be Willow Creek, ah, you know. No, you know, because 20 years later, you know what Willow Creek says? We were wrong. But every Tom, Dick, and Harry was jumping on the Willow Creek bandwagon, and and and, and it's it's the same thing with uh, Willow with not Willow Creek, uh, purpose driven church and stuff like that. And you know, you know, I'm I'm just real cautious about getting on board with anything. And and uh, even uh, now, there's no, now as far as I know, there's nothing wrong with the IFCA. But I'm a, I'm even squeamish about being part of the IFCA because one one thing that they go belly up on, and then the whole thing just go. And then my name is on with that. So hopefully that will never happen. <laughs> so, but, so, um, 
We need to be cautious with that because many times something goes wrong with that covenant. And then, and then what, what goes wrong, here, here's the thing. What goes wrong, we end up being part of that covenant. We have to defend them. Do you get my point? Even when they're wrong. Well, wait a minute, you were part of that. Well, what, uh, what do you have to say to that? Next thing you know, in some, in some cases, there's, uh, there's a, uh, there's a TV, there's a TV reporter who sticks a, who sticks a microphone in, you know, right in your face and said, explain why you're part of that organization. Well, it wasn't that way when I signed up. So, there's always caution with that. And here's the thing. When everybody jumped on the Promise, Pe- Promise Keepers bandwagon in Will Creek, it was, I have no doubt that it was done with good intention, and you can name other things, and this is on tape, and, and there's people in different parts of the world that are going to hear this, so I'll get in trouble anyway. So, but there's no doubt in my mind that all these things are done with good intention, but then it turns out to be, it doesn't work out. And that's exactly what happened to Israel here. That is exactly what happened to Israel here. So, chapter 10, follow along with me as I read. As soon as Adonai Zadok, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, and Piram, king of Jarmuth, to Jephiah, king of Lachish, and to Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike at Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Remember what they called themselves in chapter 9? We, remember? We are your servants. See? They were trying to schmooze them. That's what they were trying to take. They were trying to save their skin. Do not relax your hand from your servants and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went, uh, Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. When's the last time we heard that? Just, I don't really expect you to know this, but it's been not since chapter 8, verse 18, that we have heard God say something. Why? Because in chapter 9, they didn't consult God on whether they should make this covenant. So now God says something. Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent from Beth Horon and struck them as far as Zika and Makeda. And they fled before Israel while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon. And the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as, 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 oh, I get this name screwed up all the time. 
Who wants to help me here? Oh, I had it on the tip of my tongue. Thank you. But the other one is Makita, not Stan Makita of the Chicago Blackhawks. Okay. And they fled before Israel while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horan. The Lord threw uh, uh, large stones down, okay, and then there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. What happened here? They chased them. They chased them, and God put down hailstones and killed more men than Israel did with their weapons. Verse 12, at that time Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, and your Bible should have a different printing of this. This is actually a poetry here. Okay? Son, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord obeyed the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned, and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Hasn't been a day like that since then. I think that is an amazing fact. So here we go. If you're looking at your notes there, Israel comes... Israel comes to the rescue. The first thing that they did is that the kings mustered their armies together. The text teaches us that the king of Jerusalem not only knows what Joshua has done to Jericho and to Ai, but also what the Gibeonites did. Why did why did this guy care about Gibeon? Well, because the text says it right there. It is like one of the royal cities, and it was bigger than Ai. And if he already wiped out Ai, what do you think is going to happen to Gibeon? And and see, this is why this, it was strategic, because if 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 God was to take out Gibeon, then Jerusalem and, uh, and all of the other ones... We're, we're, we're next. So his thought was, we got to go take Gibeon to stop Joshua. And he couldn't do it by himself, so, so he gets these other guys to come in and, uh, and do it, to help him out. And here's the thing, and this really rings true today. If you, for, for some reason, if you don't care or you haven't been watching the news about what's happening to the Ukraine right now, you better be worried about it. All of us, not just you, me too. Because if the Ukraine falls, the whole country falls, let me tell you, the Iron Curtain is coming back. The same principle here. The king of Jerusalem was worried about Gibeon because of that place fell, if that city fell, just a matter of time before it got to him. So that's what he did. Because it was greater than Ai, and he knew all that out, he wanted to protect themselves and their kingdoms. You know why? All their stuff. All their stuff. So they banded together. Gibeon used to be their ally. Think about that. Gibeon used to be their ally. Now they're going after them. God's plan is for them to take all of Canaan. All right? So the kings muster their armies together. The Gibeonites then plead for help. Relying on their covenant, they remind Joshua, God bless them, hey, your servants need your help. They knew that they were in real danger, and they asked for help. You know, when 9-11 happened, 
I was just amazed of how the secular community went to the religious people for help. Right? That's the first thing they did. They went to, well, they first went to some of the big shots in the religious realm, but that's what they did. They they didn't know where to turn. They turned to God's people to find answers or for comfort or for uh, help. And, and, And this all had to do when people started coming to the religious part of this country, they wanted comfort. They wanted comfort. And I think sometimes in our own lives, when there's a heavy burden in our life, we forget, I know I do, we forget who to go to. Does that ever happen to you? I know it happens. I, I know it happens to me. Now, I, I think I can guess here, and I think I'd be 100% right, that each and every person sitting here, there, there, there is a burden that's on your heart right now. Could be some, it could, it different, could be different for every person, but there's a burden about something, about somewhere. Can I remind you, because this is a reminder for uh, me too. You know what? We have a place to go to that God's Word teaches that we're to give those burdens to. Especially when we're in danger. And especially when we make bad mistakes. I know we talked about mistakes last week. Well, we're going to touch upon it here too. So the Gibeonites plea for help because you know what? They made this covenant. So they're going for help. We are, don't forget your servants. The next thing here, and here is the Lord's promise. And that's back in verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Uh, would it be safe to say, what, whatever you're fearful today, do not fear them? I, I think it would be safe to say for each and every one of us, do not fear them. I, and, and I know most of you, it, this means nothing to most of you, but I've got a game to referee tonight. It's a big playoff game at 8 o'clock. And one of the teams that I'm refereeing hate my guts. They hate my guts. And they're a little intimidating. And I've been praying about it since Wednesday. Lord, really, I did. You know why? Because I because I got a call on Wednesday and, and said, uh, Pastor, you know which game you're refereeing Sunday night? The team that just loves you. So I said, okay. And, but, but here's the thing. You know what? Can I tell you? Don't be afraid. Whatever the burden is, or whatever the strife is, do not be afraid. Because the Lord promised Joshua and the Lord promises us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. The same goes for both. Don't think that just, uh, this just matters him. But I know most of you have know this and most of you have heard this. The thing is, though, do you take it to heart? That's why I sent you that email this morning. That's why I printed what is in your bulletin, how God is just showing me, showing me that his book is not just a bunch of information, that it's supposed to be used for our transformation. But that is the Lord's promise. Next is the Lord's strategy. I think this is a good one. I kind of think that we should do this with all wars. So what does Joshua do? Him and his guys march up all night. They march up from, um, from Gilgal to Gibeon. How do you think the soldiers felt? Now they're marching uphill. They were probably pretty tired. Nancy would have been with her uh, wheelie thing there. But they're tired. So what does God do? God took hailstones and killed many of the soldiers. And let me see. I, oh, here you go. Can you see that? Okay. I want you to look. See? 
they marched, it's kind of blurry, but they marched up. They marched, and the road was going up, and they hit them, the text says, as they were going down. Okay? So now, so now you kind of get that, what they were doing. They went up, and then the text says that the hail, that the hailstones came down on them as they were going down the ascent. So, so you get a little picture of um, how that all is. I thought that was pretty neat. So, so uh, that's what was going on, and that's how God helped them. And remember that these guys were tired, and so God just helped them out. He threw down these stones, and who and here? Get this. Who did the hailstones hit? Just the enemy. You ever thought about that? Just the enemy. It, and, you know, there's, there's, the, the, the text doesn't say, you know, none of Joshua's guys going, ah! you know. No, he hit just the enemy. And here's the thing. When you and I are really in, in God's will, God uses here, God uses resources throughout this universe to help us. I really hope you believe that. That God uses resources within this whole universe to help us. Now, when we're not in God's will, as Jonah found out, he uses the universe's resource against us. Okay? Did you get that point? He can use the universe's resources to help us or to be against us, whether we're in his will or not. So now Joshua prays for God's help. And that, those are those, li- those, those two lines there that are in there. It's, it's actually a uh, poem. So there are multiple armies. Now here, there's multiple armies for Joshua to conquer here. So what does he do? He prayed that the day would be longer so they could finish the job. Because you know what would happen if it turned dark? That's right. The enemy would book on out of there and they couldn't be seen. Now, many people will deny that this even happened because they think God is done with miracles. Well, what, and, and there's been debate. There, there's, did the earth stop? Did the earth stop on its axis? Did, 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 it, did it just hold up? You know what? I am not a scientist. I am not a theologian. Don't want to be either one of them. But the text says that God prolonged the day. And you know what? God can do anything he wants to do. Okay? The text says he made the day a little longer so nighttime wouldn't set in so they could finish the job. That's what he did. He was in control of everything. And the statement here, is it not written in the book of Jashar? This, um, this is a, a book of early, early, early Jewish poetry. That's why in your text, in your Bible, it should be written differently. It should be printed differently than just verse, 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 because it because it was written in poetry. But who you know who is this all about? You know you know we can talk about the soldiers and the guys being killed and and, and you know what I just see God. God's name written all over this. Jehovah's name, you know, not only thrown, you know, I've often told, um, uh, I, I think I, uh, in my frustration with our children when, uh, when uh, they were young, I might have said, you know what, God's going to hit you with hail as big as watermelons one of these days, you know. But, but this is all about Jehovah and his power, and he can do anything else. Here are a couple lessons learned here. God uses your 
mistakes to accomplish his plans. Here's the thing. I really want, really want you to see this. Israel made a mistake by making this covenant with them. God used this whole mistake. Look what he did now. Look what he did. He gathered all those kings into one city. They didn't have to go traipsing around Canaan to get them. He brought them into the one place to get rid of them. The mistake that Israel made, God used that. God used that for His purpose, to accomplish His plans. I think that's great. And then, they didn't have to practically lift a finger. He took care of most of it. Man. God uses yours and my mistakes to accomplish His plans. The last thing is, When you believe His promises, obey His commands, and act by faith, you can expect His help. I really want you to see. Look at that. Look at that statement, please. When you believe His promises, obey His commands, and act by faith, you can expect His help. You and me can expect His help. Now, let's turn it over and look at it the opposite way. If you do not believe his promises, if you do not obey his commands, and you do not act act by faith, let me tell you, don't expect his help. I hope you see my point. God uses mistakes, ours, to fulfill his plans and his purposes. Don't lose heart. We all make them. And he's there to help us through our obedience and our trust in his promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for your love, your love for us. Lord, special blessings, Lord, Lord, for Steve and for Jan and, and everything, not only what they mean for us, but Everywhere else within this country, Lord, and overseas, bless them, Lord, please. Help us, Lord, to trust in you that you are going to learn about the mistakes we make and you're going to use them for your glory and it's going to go on forever and ever and help us to trust you with that. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Endeavor, And help us to trust you with that. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen endeavor and help us to trust